Hi there, Jake Miller here, and I'm going to be collaborating with my friend Dave Turnett to teach you a little bit about the basics of using Scratch. So first off, this session is titled Scratching the Surface, Trying Out Scratch, and if you want to get to just the slides of this, the bit.ly link is up at the top there, but the slides will be essentially what's in this video here, so you don't really need to go to that, but it's there if you need it. Second, down below there, you can see our contact information. Again, I am Jake Miller. I currently work at Brady Middle School in Orange City Schools in Ohio. My uh, Twitter handle is at Jake Miller Tech. And my good friend here is Dave Turnett, who currently works at Kempton Middle School in Stowe, and his Twitter handle is at Dave underscore Turnett. Dave is a 7th grade STEM teacher in Stowe. I used to teach 8th grade STEM uh, as, uh, and collaborated with him there at Stowe, but I now am a technology integration specialist in my role in Orange. Hi everyone. As Jake said, my name is Dave Turnett. I teach at Stowe at Kempton Middle School, 7th grade STEM, and we have been using Scratch for uh, about four years now. Um, we have also been trying to get the elementary students to start using this, so they have really started using it a lot, and um, they've been really successful with having it work uh, for them, uh, making projects and, and uh, school presentations. Uh, so you can use Scratch for anything. It's really a great program. Uh, you can get a hold of me if you want to at uh, with Twitter at, at Dave underscore Turnant, and uh, if you want my email address, I'm sure Jake can give that to you uh, if you would like to get a hold of me and ask a few more questions. So uh, let's get started with a couple of things here and Jake will continue. Uh, next, a note over on the left over here, you will need a computer for doing this. Scratch is not currently available on tablets. There's a Scratch Junior on iPads, which works well uh, to lead into what Scratch does, but it's more for younger children. Uh, so that's what's available on tablets, but not available. Uh, the, the regular Scratch is not available uh, on tablets. Soon, Scratch is working on what's called Scratch 3.0. This what we're talking about now is considered Scratch 2.0. Scratch 3.0 is supposedly coming out sometime in 2017 and will have some, some, some support for tablets, but there's no set release date for when this happens. So a little bit of background on what Scratch is. Scratch was made uh, by a group of people at MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. It introduces the ideas of programming and authoring software. It is web-based and it uses what are called graphical puzzle blocks uh, that lock together that actually run code uh, for you. It could be appropriate for any student over the age of probably second grade. It could potentially be appropriate underneath that grade, but uh, underneath second grade the the, the reading involved and the terminology used might be a little bit too lofty for, for students that uh, below that grade, but with some adult support, they may be able to do it. Under that grade, it's really probably best to use Scratch Junior and then move into this later. Uh, so Scratch makes, makes for two kind of things, a really great introduction into what computer programming and computer science really are, so that you understand what typing code really actually does. And it also, on the other end, is a really great way to create things, create interactive things, games and animations, and things that in education could be used to uh, show or review content area knowledge. So Scratch could be really powerful, both just to learn how to code and to actually represent and visualize things. Okay, so one, one of the things that I really wanted to make sure that you guys understood was that uh, Scratch is actually a, a, a language on a computer. It's actually JavaScript, um, so it's a programming language. It's just covered up with the nice blocks. Um, JavaScript is really nice for graphics, and it makes it look really nice. Um, the uh, JavaScript is used on web pages for any time you have the scrolling graphics, uh, any kind of um, uh, pictures, uh, any kind of media. It, it helps out in coding the web page like you want it. So. Um, just in case you would like to see what that looks like, um, if you ever go to code.org, which is another um, really good coding source uh, to kind of teach how um, coding works with uh, the graphic blocks, um, here's one. Uh, I completed a puzzle, number 17, in the classic maze, and you'll notice that I have a couple of loops and movements, turn right, move forward, um, if the path is to the left, you're going to turn right. So um, if you want to look at and see what that looks like uh, with the code, if I click on Show Code, you can see this is what JavaScript looks like underneath all those blocks. So each one of these re is represented in JavaScript with a, one of those blocks. 
So you can see that it says move forward a certain number of pixels, um, turn right, and then if the path is on the left, that kind of thing. So this is what JavaScript looks like without those blocks right here. Uh, you'll notice all the brackets, parentheses, semicolons. Um, it's kind of funny that kids, whenever they are learning how to type in programs, uh, they, they leave one of these semicolons out and the whole thing doesn't work or it works really bad. So uh, it's a great way to teach editing for those of you who are language arts teachers, uh, learning how to you know, edit your work and, and read what you write, that kind of thing. Um, so that's, that's code.org, what it looks like. Okay, so now we're actually going to try out Scratch. So we're gonna go ahead and, and, and do the beginning steps of doing that now. So the first step is to go to scratch.mit.edu. You're going to want to make yourself an account because without an account, you will not be able to save your work and come back to it later. And trust me, at first you might think, I'm never gonna to wanna to come into the, come back to this. But once you start building it, you're gonna go, this is awesome, this is fun, I wanna keep doing more of this. So you wanna want to have your work there. So when you get to the page, you could sign in if you already have an account, or you could use Join Scratch if you don't. So you click Join Scratch, you're gonna select yourself a username and a password and then uh, confirm the password. Now notice it says don't use your real name. The reason it does that is because Scratch is typically used by children and students, so they recommend that we don't use our real names in here so that people don't know your true identity. Um, that really just is a security thing. Obviously you're allowed to if you want. Okay, so now I'm all logged into my account and you likely are now as well. Once you've logged into your account, the first thing you should probably do is just try out Scratch to get to know what it is. And the best way to do that is just to look at the featured products or projects and look at the featured studios. And these change daily. So you'll see different things that I'm seeing. Uh, and if you scroll down, you'll see there's lots of them. I recommend finding half dozen or so to try them out because a lot of Scratch projects are very different. Okay, so you want to go into them and see just what's possible. And then we'll come back and do this more once we know how to create in Scratch. So these are things that anybody in the Scratch community has uh, created and then posted there for anybody else to look at. So let's, let's see if I pick this first one here. So you click on it and it'll take you into the project and you can see that you're in the project looking at the, the URL up here. On the right, you'll see, so you see there's three different sections here. There's the instructions area. So you want to read over what the creator put in the instructions because they're going to tell you what buttons to put to do things and what, what, the, what the goal of the game or the interactive thing is. Maybe some notes and credits down there. You do want to check over those because sometimes people do put instructions down in there um, because they, they get confused. And then over here is the actual gameplay area. And you always click the green flag either up here or right down here to start. Okay, and I recommend clicking this button to go full screen so that you can really see the whole game. So I'm going to pause now and I'm going to let you try out a couple games. Again, I recommend trying out five or six so that you can see different types of games. You'll see some are really interactive, some are not so interactive, some require clicking, some require moving the mouse. A lot of possibilities out there, so go ahead and try it out. Okay, you can always get back to the main page of Scratch by clicking on the word Scratch, the Scratch logo up here at the top left. So anytime you need to get back to the beginning, you click on that to get there. Once you have your feet wet with understanding just kind of what Scratch is, don't worry about an idea yet. Let's just get, explore how to use it. So over on the uh, right, you see your name here, and there's a drop down underneath there where you could change your profile and things and account settings. And also right next to it, you see a folder, which if you hover over it, you'll see is titled My Stuff. So when you make projects, that's where you go back to find them. So if you do this uh, flip lesson in multiple parts, you'll come back here to get the instruct, get, get back to the projects you were working on. There's also messages in here whenever another user messages you or you get a message from Scratch or things like that. So to start a project, you want to click on Create up here at the top. And again, later when you come back to these projects, you'll access them from your folder. There is a save button in here too, so you want to save regularly just to make sure you don't lose any steps in case your computer were to crash or anything. And also because they're saving, you also want to give them a name up here. So you see by default, a name is untitled, so I'm going to put it uh, put in November 2016 tutorial. Okay, And you see you always start off with this orange cat over here. I don't know his name. He probably has a name. A scratch cat is what I normally call him. He is what's called a sprite. Okay, And you can see your sprites down here. Now a sprite is just a character in your game. 
and maybe a character is a bad name for it because it doesn't necessarily have to be a, an, an animate object. It doesn't have to be a person or an animal or something that moves. It could be a ball that flies at your character. It could be um, the moon. It could, it could be anything that you, essentially it's anything that you want to control in your game. By default, it's always the cat because that's just kind of the Scratch logo. So you could delete the cat if you want to by right clicking on them and clicking delete. You duplicate them. That would be if you want two cats on your screen that do different things. And you could also add other sprites. So let's talk about the different ways to add other sprites. And then I'm going to ask you to add one. So there's four different ways to add sprites. One is to click on this choose sprite from library button. And you'll see a giant library of sprites pops up. There's tons and tons of stuff in here that you could use. And you'll notice as you scroll down through here, they're not all animate objects. They are just things that you would want to be able to control in your game. Okay, so some of them are people, some of them are a pair of jeans, a flying hippo, a winter hat, all kinds of stuff. So just pick one for now. It doesn't have to be part of an actual creation you're planning on making. We're just learning how to use it right now. So go ahead and pick something and put it in your game. So I'm going to use this flying hippo. Okay, so now you see I have two different sprites. Okay, and they're right on top of each other. I can drag them around up here on the screen if I want as I set things up. Notice the other ways that you could uh, put in your sprites are with this paintbrush here. That's for actually painting a new sprite. So if you click on that, you get this blank palette over here to create your own sprite. And you see you now have a third sprite down here, or I now have a third sprite, which is just nothing. So I can come in here and put in a smiley face. And then there's that sprite over there. Let's go ahead and finish giving, making my smiley face. Yeah, look at that smiley face. That's nice. So now, so now he's one of my sprites out there. Okay. So and if you want to uh, want to create something like that to use, you can do that. One thing you want to watch with your sprites is when you move them, you always want to pay attention to where the center of them is. So I often use this button right up here on the top to center uh, your sprite into the middle. So let's see, I want the center of my sprite to be right there. And that way, anytime that I'm moving him around, click to release it there. Anytime I'm moving him around, that way it's moving around his center there. And you may also want to change the size of it because he's really big out there on my screen. And I can't change his size from out here. I have to change his size in here where I'm actually making the sprite. Okay? So you could explore with that. Your next option to make a sprite is to upload a sprite from a file. So if you happen to have a file on your computer that's a picture of your dog or if you download an image of... Um, a Starbucks cup of coffee off the internet and you want them to be part of your game then you would just click on that button and bring in that file and that becomes a sprite in your game. The fourth one is similar it's actually using your webcam so if you have on a device that has a webcam you're gonna want to click on that button allow it to use your webcam allow it to use your webcam and then take a picture of yourself and then that picture once you click save, can then also be a sprite in your game. Now, I've had a lot of students that, well, not a lot, but I've had some students that do this, and then they actually go in and edit that sprite to take out the surroundings of it so that I don't have the, the stuff around me there. And the way you would do that is, I believe, to go to costumes, and then there you can see that sprite editing thing. So you can also do this with your hippo. Let's say, oh, I love that hippo, but I don't want him to have wings, or I want the wings to be pink. You can come in here and mess with things like that. You see the tools over here. Let's let's give my hippo pink wings. There we go. There we go. Make it a pink hippo. So now you can come into costumes to change what your hippo looks like. Okay. Same with your sprite and anything you want to change. So with the picture of me here, I can do remove background here and see if that works. And then what you do is you take this green dot and kind of trace around what the background of your photo is. So why don't you pause me right now, or it's going to pause me automatically right now, and try doing the four different types of sprite addition. So, that, so selecting a sprite that's already in there, um, creating your own sprite, opening a sprite from your computer, and putting the sprite from with your webcam. Uh, and then if you want to, also go into costumes and edit any of those that you want. Okay, so once you've created your sprites or selected your sprites, you'll notice that, the, that you can move around your sprites on the screen, but you want them to be able to move as part of your game. I'm going to delete this picture of me because he's just going to get in the way here. So I right-click and click Delete here. 
Notice that when you click on each of your sprites out here, it tells you an X and a Y number over here. That's because your the, the game area, the interactive display area, is like a coordinate plane. So as you move your mouse around, it's changing that X and Y value. And if I take this hippo from here and move it over to here, he now has a different X and Y value. So that's the stuff that you use in order to make your sprites move. So under scripts, the blue button, the first one is motion. Okay? And the most simple part of motion is just basic movements. Okay, So kind of going down through, through here in order. The first one is move 10 steps. Now that really means like 10 pixels, so that's not very much. So it's not going to move very far when you do that. So you drag out move 10 steps, and if you click on it, you'll watch the hippo will move over to the right a little bit. Okay, I could also click in there and make that say move 30 steps, and then when I click on it, he's going to move in bigger jumps. Okay? And that's a block that you can connect to your code to be able to move, have things move on the screen. Now notice that only moves forward. You could also change this to move negative 10 steps and click on it. And see he's moving backwards. The downside of that is he's not turning around when he moves backwards. So that's a choice you have to make. And there's a way to make him turn around and move. <coughs> now, you can also link together multiple ones. So what if I say move 10 steps back? and then move 30 steps forward. And then because they're linked, I can click and I'll watch him. He'll go back and forward. Hmm. And it looks like you don't see one of those movements in there. So I'm going to go ahead and jump forward and tell you another thing here. Under control over here, you see a button that says wait one second. And if you put this out here and you could change how many seconds it waits, sometimes you need to put in a little wait between blocks of code so they don't happen at the same exact time because that's what happens so this my hippo now is going to move 10 steps back wait a second and then 30 steps forward maybe you want to make this 0.3 seconds so it happens a little bit faster you can you can put in decimals if you want to but that's how you make two things happen in succession so go ahead and pause and play with the move and the wait tools now, next, notice I said that that only moves him forward and backward and he doesn't turn around. Well, there's some other tools over here. There's also change X and change Y. Okay, so X obviously moves him forward. So this is just like the move tool. So if I make this say change X by 30 and I click on it, it's the same as moving 10 steps forward. If I make it negative 30, it's going to be the same as moving 30 steps backwards. Same kind of tool. Change Y is when you want your thing to jump or whatever. So here it says change Y by 10, so now he's jumping. Okay, so take a moment to mess with the change X and change Y options. Okay, so there's also some other things in here that you could explore. If you want to get really deep into using Scratch, go for it. If you are just kind of getting a, a basic idea of it, that's fine. You could stop there. Um, you've got these options, say point and turn, that are how you can make him turn around when he moves. Not something you need to necessarily get into right now, though. There's also set X and Y to a certain number. So this means if you want your hippo at a certain point to go back to the middle of the screen and you click on it, that's going to jump him right to the center of the screen. Same thing if you set Y to zero. So you can see how that could be useful uh, in games and things like that. Now, when you're a user, and you, you tried this out earlier, when you're trying out a game, you don't see this right area over here with all these buttons. You just click the keyboard or move the mouse and things like that. That's because you need to control these movements. So that under events, you see these options like when the green flag is clicked, or when the space bar is clicked. Those are the two most popular one, or most common ones to use. So if you use when the space key is pressed and move it out here, maybe I say when the space key is pressed, I want my hippo to go 10 steps back, wait 3 tenths of a second, and 30 steps forward. So now, I don't have to click on this anymore. I can click the space bar, and he does it. Now I can also put that here. That's him going backwards, and I can make it be, watch this here, I can make it be the left arrow. So now if I click the space bar, 10 back, 30 forward, click the left arrow, 30 back. And I can make this be when I click the up arrow. So if I click the up arrow on my computer, he jumps up. By the way, some people, if they want their thing to jump, they would then put in, go up by 10, wait a second, and then go down 10. So go ahead and mess with using keyboard keys to move your object. Now the other button we talked about in there was the when green flag clicked. 
That's if you want something to happen automatically without being controlled as soon as the game starts. That's the green flag. That's what starts the game. So if you want your thing to just move as soon as the green flag is clicked, then you would hook this onto the front of it. So maybe as soon as the game starts, I want my hippo to go to the center of the screen. That's the way I would make that happen. Let's next talk about different sprites doing different things. So you see my pink hippo down here is who I have selected, and I have all these blocks of codes. If I click over to Scratch Cat, I have no blocks of code, and if I click to my smiley face, no blocks of code. That's because each of your objects has different actions that it completes, and that's how you create a really rich game experience where each of your sprites are doing different things. So I can make it that my hippo does that movement when I click space, but when I click space, the mouse, I'm sorry, the mouse, the cat is going to make a sound. So let's talk about it and make sounds. So I'm going to say play sound meow, then I'm going to say uh, motion, I want you to jump 60 spaces up. Okay, so now when I click the space bar, you'll notice that my hippo moves, my cat meows, and my cat moves. Okay, now here's a problem that people run into a lot. What if I click the space bar and my cat goes off the screen? Sometimes it does happen that they actually push all the way off the screen. If they're just slightly off, you could always drag them back down in. A shortcut that I use occasionally if, if I lose my, my scratch cat or whatever is I will bring in this piece of code that says set Y to whatever. And then if he's off the screen, I can click that and he comes back down to where I want him to be. Just a little trick there. Let's continue talking about sounds though. Okay, so in sound, you see I use that play sound meow button. Okay, I could also change to other sounds or record sounds. Okay, so um, I could I could have a piece of code that stops the sound. I could have it play a drum. I could have it play a certain note. I could have it get louder. I could have it get quieter. I could change the tempo of it. I could do all kinds of different things. And the way that I access different sounds is by clicking right here. And there's an, again an open sound from a file button. So this would be if maybe you. Um, saved a mp3 file to your desktop or something like that so I could open a sound from there I can record a sound right now using the microphone on my computer I can also use the speaker to choose a sound from their library so in the in their, their library maybe I want this music maybe I want this alien sound or this alien sound or this birthday sound so there's a whole bunch of sounds in there that you could use and all you have to do is double click on it and now it's one of the sounds that you could use in there. So now that I've added it to the sound library for this uh, Scratch project, I can jump over to scripts, and now in my button here, it's gonna now have that other sound in there. So go ahead and mess with adding sounds. Next, I mentioned this earlier, but you may want to add in something that happens at the start of your game. You don't actually have to. The game could just start with the screen not moving, like my game right now. If you hit the green flag, nothing would happen. I would just hit the space bar and things like that to make things happen. But you might want to say, hey, when it starts, so events, when green flag is clicked, when it starts, I want my smiley face sprite to turn 15 degrees or turn 90 degrees. Okay, so now if the green flag is clicked in my game, my uh, smiley face is going to turn 90 degrees. I'm only going to do it once. Okay, so let's talk about the next thing. Well, actually, pause right now and see if you want to add something in that relates to a green flag being clicked. The next thing we need to talk about is loops. Loops are a big part of coding, so it's great to make sure that students use it when they're doing Scratch. Maybe I want in my game my smiley face to repeatedly turn, okay? So I might want to say, okay, when the green flag is clicked, turn 90 degrees, and then wait a second, and then turn another 90 degrees. Hold on. Bring it out here, turn 90 degrees. I could actually duplicate these things. So maybe I click on it and click duplicate, and then I got this part here and I could put it in. But even still, this becomes kind of tedious to have to, to select things and duplicate them and put them out. So instead, I might just want to use a loop. So let's watch and see what happens here first. That's great. It doesn't end where I want it to end, so I guess I need another one down there. Or maybe I just need to, you know what I need to do is get them back to where he should be. There we go. Now, that's a lot of blocks to have to put out there. So what you could use instead is a loop. So under control, where we got the weight from, we see repeat and we see forever. 
okay? So maybe in my game, as soon as you click the green flag, this smiley face starts going around. So I want it to turn 90 degrees, I want it to wait one second, and then I want it to happen again. So I'm gonna get rid of all this code, just drop it out of here. And I'm gonna put this in. So now when I click the green flag, he's gonna turn, 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 and just keep doing it and waiting one second every time. And it's gonna go on forever. Or I could have brought in a repeat block and put in a certain amount of time that I wanted to repeat for it. Maybe I want to repeat three times, okay? By the way, I'm gonna hit the stop button here to make it stop. So go ahead and try out the repeat and forever blocks. A couple things that you, you really want to get into if you start actually making some stuff in here is using the if then and if then else blocks. Those are things that are a little bit more sophisticated, but you could bring that out here and use these sensing things. So like if this smiley face sprite is touching the cat sprite, then do this. So it's got to have something that creates, makes it start, which would be like the green flag, and then it starts looking for that thing happening. Maybe a little bit above a beginner's usage right now, but if you want to try it out, go ahead and pause right now and try it out. Okay, let's mess with three more things. Next up is backgrounds. So notice over here your background is white. Well, you can also have different backgrounds. So you see up here on the backgrounds tab, you can have, uh, I don't know if it's unlimited, but you can have a bunch of different backgrounds. Once you click on your backdrop down here, you'll have the backdrops button up here so that you can go in and mess with your backdrops. Notice when you're on a sprite, you don't see the backdrops button, you see costumes. So if you want to, you can add a new background down below here that is this baseball field. Okay, so now I have two different possible backgrounds and I could use the code to make it change which background is up. So go ahead and take a moment to add some backgrounds, either using their library, by creating your own, by uploading your own, or by using a picture that you take right now on your webcam. Now back in your code, if you want to mess with that changing, then under scripts, we see looks, and here is switch backdrop to, or switch backdrop to and wait, or go to the next backdrop. So you could put in code that makes it switch backdrops at different times. So feel free to take a moment and go ahead and try that out. Okay, let's mess with costumes for your sprites. So if we go to your cat that maybe is still there and click on costumes, you'll notice that your cat actually has two costumes, one where his feet are down and one where his feet are kind of up and back. The reason they do this is because then you can make your cat looks like he's, looks like he's running. And remember, we talked about how to create costumes before as well. Remember, we changed our hippo from being what it was a, a green hippo with blue wings, I think, to being a pink hippo with pink wings. You could have a bunch of different colored hippo costumes and then have them changing throughout your game. And you would do that by clicking on one of your costumes, right-clicking, and actually duplicating it so that you can make, then make changes to it. Now back out here in your script, so if you jump out in your scripts, under looks, you see switch costume and next costume. So I could, on my cat, make it go, well, here I have him jumping up in the air. So let's say when he jumps up in the air, I also want him to go to looks. I'm going to click switch costume to costume 2. So when I click spacebar, my cat is going to meow, change to the other version of the costume, and then uh, and then go up in the air 60 spaces. So I'm going to put him on costume 1, go back to that, and now if I hit spacebar, watch him, you see his legs change. So you, people will use that when they're going forward to make him look like he's running as he goes across the screen. Last thing I want to look at is making your cat say stuff. So let's, and this is an audio, we talked about sounds earlier, you could actually put in words. So under looks, you could see say hello, think hmm, so say is just a word bubble and think is just a thought bubble. But I could say, when my cat jumps up in the air, I want him to say woo, boo for two seconds. Yeah, let's move him down on the screen here. Okay, and you see the woohoo bubble come up and go away. Now, if I didn't use the for two seconds, I use this one and just put in, say, woohoo, and I click space. You'll notice that the woohoo stays there permanently. So that's the difference between say and say for blank seconds. The only difference with think is that it looks like a thought bubble. So go ahead and pause and try out adding in those texts. 
And that's it. As you can see from here, there's plenty of different other tools that you could use in here. In each of these different tabs, we only went through like half of them or less, and there are other tabs that we didn't even touch on. So if you're interested in moving forward, now's a good time to think about what exactly you want to do and learn about those specific tools. What I'd recommend doing last is obviously saving this project because it does save to an extent automatically, but if you really want it to save all of your work, you've got to click that Save Now button. So we recommend students do that over and over and over again throughout the, throughout a class period or whatever while they're working. Scratch, uh, there is a really nice options for you for getting help if you don't understand uh, what you're trying to do. Um, if you look at the uh, editor, you'll notice that there are going to be a couple of um, help buttons. The first one is the slide out tray. It's in the right right underneath where it says the project page there's a, a question mark if you click on that you get this slide out tray you'll notice that there's a whole bunch of tutorials so you can learn how to make a pong game you just click on it it shows you step by step on how to create a pong type game um, you can go back to uh, animate your name uh, sort of like a flappy bird kind of thing but there's a whole bunch of uh, tutorials on how to do uh, make certain kinds of games if you want. You can also do a how-to. Uh, this answers a specific question. So, like, in if you're let's say you're creating a game, um, how do I use my arrow keys to move? Uh, you can click on that, and it will show you the exact code to use for all of this. So that's these are some pretty good ways to do that. Um, another way is if you have, let's say I want to use this point toward mouse pointer block. All right, so this is the block that I want to look at, but I'm not really sure how it works. If I click on this um, block help button, click on that. Notice that my cursor changes to a question mark. Um, and then if I click on this, slide out happens and it goes right to and tells me how I can use this uh, block in my program. All right. So that, those are a couple ways that you can use um, the help features in Scratch. Really makes it simple. Um, Scratch really does a good job in trying to help you out and make your program as successful as possible. Before you actually start building something of your own, is I recommend that now you go and try out other people's games again. Because when you first played the games, you were like, this is pretty cool, but how did they do this? Now you know the basics of how to do it, and now you can go like, oh, they're using the move forward button here, they're using the say button here, they're using a repeat loop here. And when you go to those actual games to try them out, let me get to one, you could actually see their code. You can't edit it. So I went earlier to the electrical path game. Let me get it loaded up here again. And you know, here's the instructions they put in, the notes and credits. Here's the game area. Here's the green flag up here. And you're like, oh, this all makes sense now. And it tells you how many scripts and sprites are involved in the game. Now, you're like, I, now I know what a script is. Those are those commands that you drag in. You know what a sprite is. So now these things all make sense to you. But you can also click see inside and see the code that this person actually used to create their game that they're playing. So now you can go in there and go like, Ah, that's how you do that and learn from other people's examples. This one's a pretty pretty detailed one you could see here. You can also remix other people's creations. That's what you have to watch out with students too. You can make a copy of their project and change it up to be how you want it to be and then it becomes your own. Okay, so now is the time to have some fun with this stuff. So if you're watching this video as part of the WVIZ PBS Idea Stream Technology and Learning Conference, now is the point where you're ready now for the session that's going to happen at the conference. At the conference, we're just going to try to create something. It's going to be creation time with my support uh, to help you and with the support of the people around you and they have a chance to share with people. So hopefully you've done this so that you know how to do everything and then you can create something on that day. So have fun getting to know how, you know how to use Sprite. If you're inspired, start exploring and learning how to do more. Otherwise, we'll see you at the conference and you can start putting stuff together then.